Why is it that despite all of our technological progress, we find ourselves so much divided along the lines of race, religion, caste, nationalities, and other brackets of identities? In the last two decades, the emergence of social media was actually meant to bring the world together, but ironically, we have failed. We have created a far more divided society than ever before. We have built these platforms that have facilitated communication, but we have lost communion. What really went wrong? Why is it that the 21st century man is so much pitted against his own kind? Why has all our efforts and wisdom failed us in our pursuit of a better friendly neighborhood? I would say it is because we thought that we can ground humanity without God and we have failed. Slogans like humanity is my religion, as fanciful as it may sound, it carries echoes of modern secular humanism that is driven by a notion that humans can unify, do well and progress without acknowledging our divine origins whatsoever. The way humanity is construed today is antithetical to the Christian idea of man, at least on two fundamental points. Firstly, when we talk in length about humanity, notice that the very word humanity carries a false implicit axiom that man's default nature is benevolence and kindness and compassion and goodness and any form of evil is rather inhumane. In other words, evil is treated as a deviation from the default human nature. Now such a view is evidently contradicting the Christian proclamation that man is fallen by nature and desperately needs a savior. Though we constantly hide and live in a state of denial, the brutal headlines that we wake up to every morning tears apart our pride and pretense. People do not rape and murder and do all sorts of evil despite being humans, but precisely because they are humans. In simple words, each one of us is a potential moral monster. So our default nature is not goodness, but as C.S. Lewis so rightly said, the normal state of humanity is barbarism. Now, secondly, a solely human-centric view of unity and progress is antithetical to the Christian idea that your horizontal relationships will not be restored until your vertical relationship with God is set right. Because all the brokenness that we see in the world today is a result of man first losing his communion with his maker. We will never be able to transcend our so-called group identities unless we get God back into the frame of reference. That is why in the Gospels when Jesus was asked to name the greatest commandment, he mentioned two of them. The first being to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. But notice that he did not stop there. He mentioned the next one too, to love your neighbor as yourself. Because in the Judeo-Christian worldview, these commandments are inseparable from each other. To put it precisely, if you love God, then you will love the ones who bear His image. On every individual is vested the grand and glorious image of His Creator. This is the highest possible dignity that any worldview, religious or otherwise, has offered mankind. And it is on this view that modern democracies have been built upon and they function on this very premise. In Luke chapter 10, you see a lawyer, he comes up to Jesus with a question, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And it's a question that Jesus was repeatedly asked during his public ministry. And no wonder, for since the fall, man has constantly been trying to stretch out his arms to the tree of life. Alas, this lawyer had no clue that he was standing before the one who himself was and is the source and giver of life everlasting. Jesus responds by invoking these two great commandments. Love God first and then love your neighbor as yourself. But in verse 28, we read the man in order to justify himself had the audacity to ask a counter question, who is my neighbor? You look at that question or rather that justification and you can sense at least two things. 
Firstly, there is an implicit self-righteousness because he is not asking anything with respect to the first commandment. He apparently thinks that his relationship with God is all right. Secondly, in the question, who is my neighbor? You sense a lack of moral accountability. It carries an echo of the old question that Cain asked in Genesis chapter 4 after having slaughtered his own brother. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Cain's merciless question has has echoed through the corridors of history in all the great evils that mankind has committed. You see that very undertone in this man's question, who is my neighbor? Jesus responds to this question with the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. In other words, Jesus responds with a nice little story. You know, sometimes giving theoretical answers may not produce the kind of impact that an illustration can drive. By this little story, Jesus actually hits two birds with one stone that not only did he answer the lawyer's question, but he also pricked his conscience by placing a Samaritan at the climax and at the very heart of the story. We know the story well. A man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho fell among the thieves. Now, given that he was traveling from Jerusalem should indicate that he's probably a Jew, but now he's lying half dead along the road. And while the questioner is listening carefully, Jesus calls into his imagination a Levite and a priest who walk by the wounded man. But all of their outward religiosity is of no service to the dying man. Then comes a Samaritan who has mercy on this absolute stranger proceeds to care for his wounds, mounts him on a donkey and takes him to an inn. Now Jesus flips the question back to the lawyer, who among the three was the good neighbor? And I find the lawyer's response very, very fascinating. In what could have been just a one word answer, the man replied, the one who showed the man mercy. Notice that he did not take the word Samaritan on his tongue and you may wonder why. Just a little bit of historical context will help that in Jesus' day, the Jews despised the Samaritans so much that in fact, if you go to John 8 verse 48, you will see that the word Samaritan was used as a slur at Jesus. It was apparently a derogatory term synonymous to an out of wedlock or an illegitimate child. The Jews considered the Samaritans as half-breeds from the Assyrian conquest of the Northern Kingdom. And in passing, let me note how beautiful of Jesus to remove this age-old stigma that was associated with the word Samaritan through this little parable that in our modern dictionaries today, the word is used to symbolize selfless charity and good work, but not so for the Jews of Jesus' day who despised both the word and the people. In fact, in the Gospels here and there, you can sense how deep the animosity was between these two groups. In geographical terms, they were neighbors, but for a very long time, they wouldn't even cross each other's territory. Territories. In Luke chapter 9, for instance, the disciples wanted an entire Samaritan village to be burned down because they refused to welcome Jesus only to be rebuked by him because our Lord was so much full of love and compassion. Uh, in John chapter 4, no wonder that Jesus chose to have that famous conversation with the Samaritan woman when his Jewish disciples were away. And we read that when the disciples came back, they were surprised to find him speaking to her. And I believe that it was not merely because their rabbi was speaking to a woman, but because he was speaking to a Samaritan woman. And on that day, Jesus broke the barriers of race and gender in one blow. The woman herself is taken aback and she's asking, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? That was not done. The gospel writer immediately informs us the cultural context and background of that question, that the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans whatsoever. They wouldn't even share the dishes for that matter. Such was the division. But in that fascinating conversation, Jesus proclaimed that the time is coming and has now come that the true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth, neither on this mountain nor on the other, a direct and a straight reference reference to the grand and glorious mystery that we now know, the church, where there is no Samaritan, no Jew, no Greek, no black, no white, no brown, no Dalit or Brahmin or Shudra. We're all one in Christ. He is our peace. 
this is the gospel and after the cross and the resurrection when Jesus was ascending back to heaven he entrusted his disciples with what we now call the Great Commission but notice that Jesus did not merely say to go from Jerusalem to the ends of the world and it was not a random choice of words by our Lord when he said be my witnesses in Jerusalem, then in Judea, then in Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. This gospel should first unite these two broken communities, the Jews and the Samaritans, before you take this message to the many, many fragmented communities of the world. Look back in history and you will see how the gospel has marched on from Jerusalem through Samaria, breaking the walls of divide between hostile communities and giving hope and individuality to the marginalized and the downtrodden. Our fundamental problem is sin and a separation from the Creator. Jesus alone restores our lost relationship with God and therefore irrespective of our differences, He alone can unite us in Him. No amount of philosophizing and rigorous policy making can solve for our fundamental problem which is sin. Many philosophies and ideas have come and gone, celebrated and appreciated for a while but even Eventually they have failed and faded into the refuse of history. Only Jesus Christ and what he has offered has withstood the test of time. And victoriously across continents, it continues to transform and confirm mankind to the likeness of his creator. I can't agree more with, the, with what the Muslim turned Christian apologist Nabil Qureshi so rightly said. The gospel is not just an answer that works, it is the only answer that will work.